If you were to stand outside the Supreme Court, you would see a statue of a woman. This isn't just any woman. You see, the woman that's in this statue is holding scales in one hand. Can we get that picture? There you go. Scales in one hand, and she's got a blindfold on. And in her other hand, she has a sword. She, of course, is Lady Justice, and she's the symbol of our judicial system. And when we see her, we're supposed to see this idea of fairness, of what justice actually is. You see, she's got the scales, and that indicates that things will be judged fairly. There will be, uh, you know, was, was there adequate grounds to convict the individual based upon the law? And so they're going to look at that by weighing it, and then also the sword in the hand. If there is a verdict rendered, there needs to be power that comes with that. But the blindfold is there's no partiality. That's the way it's supposed to be in the judicial system. And so when we see Lady Justice, it's a reminder that we have a judicial system that's supposed to be fair and good for all people. That's supposed to administer justice. Really quick, I'd like to quickly just define justice as we get started. It's going to be important as we go through today's message. Justice, the maintenance or administration of what is just, especially by the impartial adjustment of conflicting claims or the assignment of merited rewards or punishments. See the administration of the law. So we have the law, and the law is there for us to abide by. When we don't abide by the law, then the justice system comes into play to make sure that there is right and there is wrong, and it is determined in a court of law. It's supposed to be so that everybody can have a fair shake and a fair trial. That's the way it's set up. Justice is something that you and I both know is necessary for a free and a good society. In order for us to live in a free society and a good society, we need to have punishment when bad things happen, when there is evils that is done. And and to be honest with you, I think that we can all agree at some level here that when evil is done, there must be something that is, there must be a response to that because that's why we have laws in place. We want to make sure we're governing well. Margaret Atwood, however, said these words. She said, never pray for justice because you might get some. The truth is, I think when it comes to justice and it comes to our judicial system, we can see this through a lens that is pretty objective. We understand the necessity for justice, the importance for justice, and when somebody does us wrong, we want to make sure they receive justice. On the flip side of that, when we do somebody else wrong, we don't always want the same justice in return. Today we're going to talk about God, and there's this thing about his character and his nature that can be a little bit confusing, and in fact difficult. There's a former student of mine when I had youth ministry some years back, and currently he considers himself an agnostic. And I got in a conversation with him, and I said, can you unpack for me why you're an agnostic? He said, sure, Mike, I'm happy to do that. Now, he was very engaged in his faith when he was younger, and as he's gotten older, he's just had a big problem with God and his character and his nature. And so this is what he said to me. He said, Mike, I look at the God of the New Testament, and I see a God of love. I look at Jesus, I see a God of love who just loves, and, and, and I can wrap my mind around a God like that. We know that God is love. I've heard that since I was a small child. And as I've gotten older and older, I've also seen in the Bible, and I see a God that doesn't measure up with a God of love. He said, this is a God of wrath that I find throughout the Bible and in the Old Testament. And he said, and if God really is a God of love, how can he be a God of wrath simultaneously? It's a good question. And this morning, I just want to say that I believe that we're going to be looking at the character of God and who he is. And I believe that not only are they incongruent with one another, but they're necessary, both the love of God and the wrath of God, in order for him to still be the God that you and I know, the God that you and I read and understand in the Bible. And today, we're continuing on in our series called Identity. And by the end of today's message, I just hope that maybe we can understand God a little bit more so that when we sit in the chair of God's word 
and we allow for his word to define us and his word to give us our identity, we can have a better understanding of who we are as followers of Christ. And it comes down to this issue of justice. So far in Romans chapter 2 and 3, as we talked about last week, Paul's done a really good job of unpacking the fact that there's a lot of bad news. And the bad news is this thing called sin. And he says words like, it's legal terms. He, he talks about the law and how nobody can measure up to the law. And he says that God shows no partiality. And so when he says no partiality, it, it's this truth that first the Jew, then the Gentile, First the Jews, salvation is for them, and then the Gentile. But also, judgment is first to the Jew and the Gentile, for everybody is under the, he uses the word, wrath of God. Because of his character and his nature, we have all fallen short, is what we're going to find today, of God's righteous standard. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to talk about this and unpack it, but for the first time so far in this series, really, we see an answer that Paul gives and I got to tell you guys, it is a mind-bending answer. And, and to be clear with you, I believe that it does a good job of wrapping up how God can both be a God of wrath and a God of love simultaneously, and why it's important that we understand that about him. So if you have your Bibles, we are in Romans chapter 3. We're continuing on here, starting at verse 21. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. If you have your LifeSpring app, the notes are in there as well, as well as the scripture. Romans chapter 3, verse 21, and it says this. Um, it says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law and, uh, and the prophets. So the reality is that we know that apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, now the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So this text says a lot of different things, but the clear thing that it says here, and so there's a lot of theology in this text that we're going to unpack here today, but he uses the word righteousness of God. So we talk about God's righteous standard. That's what the book of Romans is unpacking for us, is that there's a righteous standard. There has to be a standard that everything is judged by. That's where we start. That's the standard. And the standard is God and his righteousness. Now, this is important. So the righteousness of God, this righteousness is a big, big word. Because his righteousness is what's at stake here in this text. If God truly is a God of righteousness, then he must deal with things in a righteous fashion. You see, God would not be a good God. He would not be a loving, good God if he didn't deal with uh, shortcoming, if you didn't deal with sin, that is, which is incongruent, that things that are not righteous, anything that's not righteous doesn't measure up with who God is, so he's got to deal with that in a fashion that is swift and very real. That's what makes him God. That's what holds this all together. That's what gives us the ingrained sense that there is right and wrong because God is righteous. He puts that within us. We know that there is right and wrong. And the truth about God is that he tells us that the righteousness of God has been revealed. And I'm going to write the word Jesus here. It is through Jesus that the righteousness of God is manifested to you and to me. We can see the fullness of God when we look at Jesus. The Bible says the fullness of the deity of God dwells within Jesus. So we see Jesus, we see the righteousness of God manifested to us. In other words, we receive the righteousness of God through faith. And this is for all who believe. And so while everybody is under condemnation because of sin, that's that word for wrath, we are condemned is what the text teaches us. See, we are condemned because we have all fallen short of the glory of God, which we're going to look at in just a moment and we'll unpack more. But in order to understand that, I, I, I want to open up by saying your first fill in the blank here, if, you, if you're filling in the blanks, Jesus is the righteous standard. Jesus is the righteous standard. Now, now, if I were to ask people, do you think you're a good person? Most people say, I do. I think I'm a pretty good person. And how do we gauge goodness? How do we gauge what is good and what is not good? Well, a lot of times you say, well, compared to Hitler, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. Compared to Osama bin Laden, I feel like I'm doing all right. I'm doing, doing fine. 
Compared to my neighbor down the road, I, I feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much a good person. But what if you have that scale up and you've got yourself on one side and you have Jesus on the other side? Now let me ask you, do you feel like you're a good person? The fullness of the righteousness of God is found in the person of Jesus. And because of that, when we put ourselves on that scale with Jesus, we don't come out looking very good anymore. And that's all of us. Every single person in this room, every single person who's ever lived falls well short of the glory of God. That's what the text says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It's very clear. Paul's very clear about this. And he says this, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let me ask you, who is all? Thank you. All. All literally means everyone. It means all. It means, like, there's no exception. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's what the Apostle Paul has been establishing this whole time. I mean, he hasn't given an answer. All he's done is say, if you think you're that big of a deal because you think somehow you've got this in with God that somehow you're not going to be held accountable for your sin, he's like, no, God is righteous. You will be held accountable for your sin. Everybody will be held accountable for their sin. Because that's the nature of God. And let me tell you, we wouldn't want it any other way. We want a God who's going to deal with sin. We want a God who's going to deal with the bad things of this world because if he weren't that kind of a God, he wouldn't be the God of the Bible. We wouldn't know anything else in this world. We understand justice is necessary. That's God's character. Justice is necessary. So we cry out when we see injustice. We cry out when things are, are not the way they're supposed to be. We cry out when we've been wronged because we know that justice is important. It's ingrained in all that we do in our society and in this world. See, the righteousness of God, God is righteous and he's the standard. And every single person has fallen short, so therefore the Bible says we are condemned. But the text goes on to say, and are justified by his grace as a gift. Let me read that again. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. Pretty redundant there. Because grace, by definition, is something you don't deserve. It's a gift. So he says, you're getting a gift with a gift. You see, Paul is making it very clear, it is not something that I have done to earn this. It's not something that the Jews in, in Rome have done to deserve it, the Christian Jews. It's not something that the Christian Gentiles have done to deserve it. All have sinned, all have fallen short, and they are only justified because of the righteousness of God who's been manifested. Jesus Christ is who justifies them. Now, this idea of being justified, I, I want to unpack that a little bit more because this is a legal term. This is all legal language that the Apostle Paul is using here. And this legal language is important. And here's why. I'd like to illustrate it in the form of a story here really quick. This man, he ends up going on a, a business trip. And on this business trip, we find, uh, we find that his, his Rolls Royce ends up breaking down. He's far away from home. He's driving and breaks down. So he calls Rolls-Royce and he says, I'm on this really important business trip and my, my car's broke down and I don't know what I'm going to do. And so Rolls-Royce says, we're going to send a technician out and he's going to look at it immediately. So he gets on a plane, this technician, and he flies in and he's there the next morning and he's working on this guy's car. In just a matter of a couple of hours, he gets the car working and the car's running, no problems. The guy gets back in his car and he starts driving down the road again and he's thankful. My car is now in working order. But he also knew in the back of his head, this guy went through a lot. Rolls Royce went through a lot in order to make this happen. So he finishes up his business trip and he gets home. And he ends up calling Rolls Royce and he says, Hey, uh, I just want to let you know, last week I was on this business trip and it was really important that my car was working, but it broke down. So you guys flew a technician out. And I, first off, just want to say thank you. Like, you guys... You guys went above and beyond, so thank you for that. But number two, I know it's probably really, really expensive, so can you tell me what the damages are so I could write a check and I can send it to you? And the lady on the phone says, Sir, I, I know that what you're saying you believe is true. But I just want to tell you we have no record of this ever happening at all. That's what it means to be justified. It's not like you did your sin and we're just not going to hold it against you. Being justified is just as if 
I'd never sinned. Justified. It's just as if I'd never sinned, and that is a big deal. That's the grace that we receive. We receive justification when we should receive condemnation. We live in a world that struggles with terminology. And so when it comes to who we are and how we identify, like, like I, I know that as a Christian, I'm a child of God, and so every day I sit in my chair and I say, I'm a child of God. And God, I know who you are. I know that you're powerful, you're all-powerful, you're almighty, you can do whatever you want. You choose to love me, God. You, you choose to make me of primary importance to you. And God, you have given me a purpose and you've given me a mission. And there's a lot of things that can define me. There's a lot of things that I can say, that's who I am. But the truth is, I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. I'm owned by the blood of Jesus and because of that, God, I know that you have set me free from my sin. I no longer have to be in my sin. I am no longer identified by my sin. Look at that sinner. Look at that sinner. It's not the way it works. In, uh, in this illustration, there's a word that often gets used, um, and I'm, I'm going to write this word up here. You may not be able to read it. It's Tolerance. And I think the struggle that we have in the year 2023 is when we think of the word love, we associate it with the word tolerance. I want to give a quick illustration to you really quick. I talked about giving flowers to my wife last week. If you were here, that's why you're laughing at me. I'm okay, laugh at me, that's fine. It's laughable. I gave my wife funeral flowers once. I'm just going to say that as the funeral was over, I brought them home to her. That's the whole thing. She wanted me to throw them in the trash after that, so. What if I brought flowers home to my wife, and on the note it said, I tolerate you. I mean, I think my wife would probably go, I don't tolerate you very much right now. <laughs> now, if I came home and I gave her a bouquet of flowers and said, I love you, that's a different thing. I give her a book, if I love you, and then she says, you know what, I love you too, babe. Because here's the thing, well, I think if you ever had a mom who really, really engaged with you and loved you, there's probably a lot of things she didn't tolerate about you. My mom didn't tolerate a lot of things about me. Can I just say my mom, uh, she was very clear with me what was right and what was wrong. And I'm thankful that I had a mom that told me what was right and what was wrong because I don't know who I'd be today if I didn't have a mom who did that. She loved me, therefore, there's a lot of times she wasn't tolerant of the things that I did. Now, we say that we want a God of love, but not a God of wrath. We say we want a God who, who is going to let us do whatever we want to do, whenever we want to do it, because that's like, God, can't you understand if you love me, you're going to let me live, then let me do whatever I want to do in my life. That's not how that works. Because if God is truly righteous, it's his standard that matters, not my standard. And so if God truly is righteous, I can't become righteous. That's the problem. And that's what Paul unpacks. It's not possible for me to be righteous. I will mess up on my best of days in righteousness. I will fall way short. The text says all of us have fallen short. Every single one of us. But Jesus. In the courtroom setting, Jesus does something for us. The text says, it's, here's your next fill in the blank, Jesus justifies us by his grace, just as if I'd never sinned. I no longer stand condemned. I no longer stand condemned. When he sees me, it's just as if I had never sinned. Can I just say, that's remarkable. Man, God is incredible. He does something for you and me that we could never do for ourselves. That's why it's a gift. It's grace. It's a gift. He justifies us. Now, there's something we have to do in return. It says he justifies us by faith. By faith in what? By faith in Jesus. You see, the truth is, what we're getting ready to learn here is this issue of wrath and love have to be addressed by God. And so he does it. He does it swiftly. He does it once for all, and he makes it so that now we can have righteousness where there was no righteousness. 
Before we go into this, it's not anything I've done. It's not anything you've done. It is absolutely grace. Every single one of us are filled with sin. We have had sin from our past, and the reality is this. There comes a point in time when God looks at us when we understand what we're getting ready to talk about, and he does not see our sin. Wow. I am righteous in God's eyes. Not because of me. It's because of who I put my faith in. Read these words. It says, Romans chapter 3, verses 25 and 26 says this. Jesus, it says, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Blood. The wrath of God. The wages of sin is death. God put Jesus forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. There's a lot here. There's a lot of faith language here. There's a lot of theology here. So we're going to unpack it one thing at a time really briefly. Propitiation. Propitiation is to appease the wrath of God. That's what propitiation is. That he has a wrath Because of sin, because of his righteousness, there is wrath. It has to happen. He would not be God if that did not happen. So there is a wrath, there is a punishment. And the Bible says we all stand condemned, we deserve death. That's what the Bible teaches us. And the Apostle Paul, when he finally gets to this point in the book of Romans, says God put forward to appease his own wrath, his own son, Jesus. And Jesus ended up spreading out his arms and dying on a tree, spilling his own blood where it should be your blood and my blood. If any of us ever thought that we were deserving of anything that we have done, oh God, look at all the good things I've done for you. God, look at how good I am. Compared to my neighbor, I'm so good. Compared to Hitler, compared to Osama bin Laden, I'm so good. Compared to those people down the street, I am so good. You sure about that? You know what goodness is? Goodness is a God who would see his own wrath and say, there needs to be an answer for this because I love my children so much that I don't want them to experience condemnation. I don't want them to experience life outside of me. I desperately want my children. And so he knew that this would have to be dealt with once and for all. His wrath would have to be atoned. That's the nature of our God. And he is not tolerant of sin. He can't be tolerant of sin and still be God because he would not be righteous anymore. And so he's fully love, and yet he's fully wrath. And he has to reconcile both of those. Now, what he could have done and what he should have done, maybe, it could be argued, is wipe every single person out because of our sin, because we have fallen so dreadfully short of his righteous standard. That would have been fair. That would have been fair for God to do. But you see, God God wasn't fair, not to himself, because God decided instead of them paying the punishment, I'll pay the punishment. And it says this, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. This picture of the Passover would not have been lost on the Jewish Christians because the Passover is where it all happened. The Passover is what they celebrated every year. It was the center of their calendar. It was the reminder of this God who rescued them from the hand and the bondage of their slavery. And they put the, lamb of, the blood of the lamb on the doorway and death passed right over their houses. They could not even see what was behind that. There's no sin behind that. They followed, were obedient to God and what he said, the blood of the lamb on the doorway. And so God said, I'm offering my lamb, my one and only pure and spotless lamb. That imagery very clearly that Paul says that our sin is passed right over. Literally, God does not see our sin. He does not see it. You guys, it is easy for us to define ourselves based upon our sin and the sin we have for our past and say, look at me, I'm a terrible person, I can never get it right, I'm horrible. And so last week we talked about that, we've got to put the mirror up and we've got to see the, the reality of our sin, we've got to see that. 
But the other side of that is this. God doesn't see our sin for those who are in Christ Jesus. He doesn't see it. Instead, we have righteousness. Where there should be sin, where there should be condemnation, we receive something else entirely. It's to show his righteousness. He does all this to show his righteousness. So, the wrath of God is real. The sword of God, if you will, it's real. God has to deal swiftly with sin, and so he can come down very swiftly and very truly stay true to himself because he is righteous and there needs to be a righteous standard. And so the wrath of God comes down, but the love of God stretches out his arms as far as he can, and he says, I'll take that from you. Love says, I'll take that. You deserve, you deserve wrath, but you know what? I'm going to put the wrath upon myself instead. And he stretches out his arms. Do not miss the fact God is a God of wrath. Absolutely he's a God of wrath. He has to be in order to be righteous. But he's a God of love that stretches out his arms and says, I'll take that son, I'll take that daughter. Because I don't want you to have to suffer. I don't want you to have to live in condemnation. So God had to stay true to himself. The fullness of the wrath of God and the fullness of the love of God is found in the cross. Make no mistake. Now, I don't know if, if you've, you're hearing this for the first time. You've, you've never heard it in terms like this. But there's nowhere else in all the world, in all the universe, everybody else is fighting so hard to earn their way up to God. But Christianity at its core, you cannot do that. Christianity at its core is God coming down to man and saying, I'll take that from you. Listen, God's done it all. You haven't. I haven't. The Apostle Paul's making it clear. You have no righteousness apart from Jesus. You see, it's Jesus who's done it all. He's the one who's worthy of our praise. He's the righteousness, and righteousness is made manifest to us. We can receive righteousness because of Jesus and what he did for us. And when he died on the cross and he spilled his blood, he atoned for the wrath of God. He atoned for our sin, for your sin and my sin. That's a big deal. You see, we finally have a solution now in, in this uh, book of Romans. And the solution is the cross. The solution is God taking his wrath upon himself that you and I deserve. That's the solution. And we finally have some good news. The solution is this. God imposes his wrath. If you have your fill in the blanks. God imposes his wrath upon himself. So, we can re so he can remain just and we can be justified. God can only be just. You see, he has, to, he has to address this. That's what Paul is saying. And in order for him to remain just, he's got to deal with sin. He has to. So he can be both just and the justifier. When people look, when God looks at us, he no longer sees any sin. He doesn't see our sin. But there's contingent upon one thing. It's contingent upon what we do with this thing called faith. See, when I sit in the chair of gospel and I allow for the gospel chair to identify me, it is critical that I'm not allowing this chair to identify me based upon who I am and what I've done. It's filthy rags. Our righteousness is filthy rags, y'all. It's filthy rags. When I sit in this chair and I say, Jesus, you spread out your arms and you died on a tree so that I don't have to deal with the punishment of God. I don't have to deal with the condemnation. It's not because God's an angry, hateful God. It's because he's a righteous God. And he is patient, is what Dylan read earlier. He's patient. And he longs for no one to have to be condemned. He longs for no one to suffer. The Bible says it like this. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. You know how we can feel the love of God? Because he took his own wrath upon himself for us. That's the nature of God. That's his character. When I sit in this chair, I can know it is complete. And I put my faith not in myself, but I put my faith in the person of Jesus Christ who died on a tree. And I can put my faith in him and his perfect righteousness, apart from the law. You see, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. When he died on that tree, it was complete once and for all. I do not have to be held accountable for my sin because of what Jesus did for me. 
So when you sit in that chair, remember, yes, you are filthy rags. Yes, your righteousness apart from God is nothing. But because of Christ and the faith you put in him, you can come, you can approach the throne of grace with confidence because of Jesus and what he did for you. Just as if you had never sinned. Faith is what this is all about. In fact, when you hear this sermon here today, maybe it hearkens you back to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, the whole purpose for the gospel chair that we talk about. Because the world is constantly trying to tell us who we are, trying to tell us how we're supposed to understand, how we're supposed to t- uh, how, what we're supposed to say to ourselves every single day of who we really are. The truth is, there's a lot of things about me that when I compare it to God's righteous standard, I have to adjust and say, no, God, I know that you have a plan for me, and it's what you want in my life, not what I want. My identity is not found in all of these other things. It's not found in what I wear. It's not found in how I talk. It's not found in my job, my title, how much money I make. My identity is not found in any of those things. My identity is found in Christ. The one who willingly died in my place, the one who took my punishment so I could receive his righteousness in return. That's a big deal. And so the gospel chair defines this. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 says this. The apostle Paul says, for I am not ashamed. I think this is the thesis statement of all the book of Romans. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for our sins. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by our good works. The righteous shall live by all the things that everybody else tells us we are. The righteous shall live by faith. Faith in the one who died on the, cro- on the cross for my sins to appease his own wrath. And let's be clear about this. If we think God just winks at our shortcoming, if we think that God winks at our lack of righteousness, if we think that God winks at our sin, he can't still be God and just let it all go. <laughs> his plan, his plan is so wild. He doesn't let it go. Instead, he puts it on himself. I want that kind of a God, y'all. I want the kind of God who's willingly going to die in my place even though I deserve it. That's a loving, loving God. But I also want the kind of God who wants good and righteous and he wants to know that we are doing the best we can to love him and love each other well. He's incongruent with his character when we don't. So I sit in this chair and I have to remember who God is. It's not me. I can't approach the gospel like I'm better than anybody or I've done anything to deserve it. That's not the way it works. It's by faith. Faith in the one who died in my place. And here's the takeaway today, guys. The takeaway is we are recipients of his righteousness through faith. We are recipients of his righteousness through faith. And I use that word recipient very Very thoughtfully, we've received something we do not deserve. We have received righteousness. Up until this point, we've we've been told in the book of Romans that there is no righteousness. We can't achieve it. It's only God and everybody else has fallen short. I have fallen short. You have fallen short. And even in this text, for all have sinned and fallen short of glory of God. But we are justified as if we had never sinned. We have this amazing thing of grace, grace upon grace upon grace, And we are recipients of it if we put our faith in Jesus, who is righteousness. I want to pray for you as we get ready to go to communion. And I want to make an offer here really quick here this morning. We don't do this every week. But maybe this is your first time hearing this about God's plan of salvation, that God can redeem you. That word redemption that we find in that text, that he redeems us. He justifies us. And maybe this morning it's time for you to say, I want a God who's going to justify me because I know that I'm filthy rags on my best of days. My own righteousness is nothing. And so if that's you and you're ready to make Jesus the Lord of your life and say, Jesus, I trust in you, I trust in your sacrifice, and I want to make your sacrifice personal. 
I want to follow you. I want my life to be your life, Jesus, because you died for me. I'm going to live for you. And if that's you, we would just ask that you just head to the back of the room. Tim will be there. I'll be back there in a moment as well. And uh, just, I hope this is clear. I hope this makes sense this morning. And as we go to communion, for those of you who are believers, it's another reminder of the fact that God loves you so much that he took your place on the cross.